Hello and welcome once again to this Red Gaming Tech video. Myself, Amata, where as always I'm here with the latest news from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. We've got quite an Intel focused video for you today with a few other things thrown in, so we're going to just kick right off. And today's first topic is going to be an update to Intel's process roadmap. So, what's actually happened, I hear you ask? Well, today we had the IEDM event hosted by the IEEE organization. And the CEO of ASML, Martin Vanderbink, basically took to the stage to elaborate more on ASML's vision for the future of semiconductors. And while talking about this very topic, he started talking about Intel and their vision for the future. And their slides included a lot of interesting stuff including stuff like backporting of IP to older, older processes, which obviously we have been talking about a little bit late, uh, lately, and also their plan to go back to a TikTok two-year cadence to basically try and restore some confidence in their manufacturing after it has been understandably shaken um, amongst a lot of their partners after the long-running 14NM supply issues. Now, the most interesting thing that I just said is undoubtedly the fact that they're planning on bringing back the two-year cadence of TikTok process realization. And what that basically means is once they've got 10NM sorted, all the issues are in now, they want to go back to the old process and optimization tricks that they've been doing. So a slide shown, which you can now see on screen, shows a thing titled In More We Trust. And it shows 10NM++, 10NM++ nodes and the possibility of back porting. So they're already showing here that they're already working on improved versions of the 10NM plus node. So basically they're already working on getting high frequencies and better performance out of this particular node. So like we've seen with 14NM, once 10NM is out there and all the issues are sorted, it's not going anywhere for quite some time. And by the time we see their next architecture from Intel, we're going to be sick to the back teeth of it, kind of like we already are with 14NM and its million and one iterations. One thing that's very interesting about this, however, is that this kind of pretty much confirms Paul's leaks about Rocket Lake being a backport. So obviously it doesn't explicitly mention anything about 14NM Rocket Lake, but it adds a lot of evidence that Rocket Lake is a backport because they directly mention the fact that they're looking into backporting of IPs here. Now, you, just to refresh your memory, Paul was told by two sources that Rocket Lake is a backport. Unfortunately, they can't agree on whether or not it's Sunny Cove or Willow Cove, but regardless of the semantics, they are both in agreement that Rocket Lake is going to be a backport of something. So quite interesting. I think you will agree on that. But from the potentially good news to see 10NM finally sorted out there with us for a long time, we got some uh, unfortunate news as a new security vulnerability has been discovered. Yep. You heard me correctly, yet another security vulnerability has been discovered affecting Intel CPUs by three different European universities, and it has been dubbed Plundervolt. And basically, it's identified from the ability to tweak voltage and frequency of Intel CPUs, and this uncovers secure data within Intel's SGX, or Software Guard extensions. So essentially the TLDR is that the frequency differences cause an alteration of the SGX functioning that may be exploited to uncover user information. Also as well, Plundervolt is actually a combination of two different um, vulnerabilities that we have seen previously with SGX, like Rowhammer, which is the ability to flip a memory cell value through electrical charge manipulation, and CLK, CLK sorry, excuse me, Screw, a floor enabling dynamic voltage and frequency scaling or DVFS to take full control over the processor. So as I said at the start of that sentence, in case you've forgotten because it was a bit of a long one, Plundervolt combines those two. Essentially by manipulating various um, ver the voltage and frequency within SGX, they are enough to reduce faults or errors within SGX operations and Plundervolt breaks these algorithms designed to protect encrypted data and this data has then had the potential to be recovered. And while all of this is pretty bad news, Plundervolt is one of the more severe vulnerabilities that have been found within Intel processors, there is definitely some hope because overclockers watching this video might be a tad concerned because overclocking is one of the things that can be used to cause this to happen. But 
At least for the moment, Plunder Vault may only be exploited locally. Now there is, apologies for my phone going off there, forgot to mute it. So sorry, as I was saying, for Plunder Vault in order to be executed remotely, a program must be run with administrative privileges. So just to reiterate, it's not impossible for Plunder Vault to be executed remotely, it's just very difficult and also Plunder Vault does not work through virtualization as well. For those of you wondering if there is a mitigation and what processes are affected, we do have that information as well. Intel has prepared a method of mitigation in a BIOS and a microcode update and you can find all of this information in their security advisory uh, which is going to be linked in the description up below this video. And basically this update will allow you to disable dynamic voltage and frequency control interfaces of your system. So the list of effective processes is massive as you can quite plainly see um, as I'm showing on screen and also if you're looking at the link that I provided below. But to put the TLDR on what is effective we see 6th gen, 7th gen, 8th gen, 9th gen, 10th gen as well as various generations of Xeon E3, V5, E3, V6, E2100 and E2200. But let's move on to our final Intel topic for this video that is regarding the i5 and hyperthreading. So what we have this time around is a 3D mark listing which was tweeted by Momomo a name once again you should be very familiar with and this shows that the i5-10600 processor will actually feature hyper-threading confirmed. As you can see, the specifications clearly show 6 cores and 12 logical processors with a clock speed of 3.3 GHz. And for those of you wondering about the boost clock, thanks to a reply to the tweet from Tom Apisak, we can see 4.68 MHz being shown on the turbo here. So just a nice little confirmation that we will see the i5s supporting hyper-threading this upcoming generation, which once again is expected sometime next year, early next year. But let's move on to our final topics for today, the first of which is regarding the PlayStation 5. So, what do we have this time? There's been a lot of new information about the next-gen console floating around the last few weeks, and this time we have a patent which has once again been discovered by the folks over at Let's Go Digital. Of course, you can find their link in the description below this video. As you may recall, they are the ones who shared information on the development kits as well as some controller information as well but they have published a patent from Sony which basically shows a shared controller input in single player games. So the application refers to quote bifurcation of shared controls and that is pretty much what it sounds like. It would allow you and another person on two separate controllers to basically combine your inputs to control a single character on the screen. For those of you now wondering, is this going to be a local only feature? If this patent is to be believed, the answer is no, actually, because it makes use of a quote, input aggregation server through the cloud in order to combine these inputs. So you potentially could be in two different places and enjoy the same game together, even though it would not have a traditional multiplayer mode. Now this could potentially be really interesting, you know, a game like say Octodad, for instance, where you know you and another person are controlling different limbs. Now obviously that game does that have a capability remote um, not remotely sorry when you're playing locally but that would be really interesting if you and another person basically sharing different controllers but the same uh, control scheme could be done on a per sort of console basis rather than a per game basis so the potentiality to have some pretty funny playthroughs with this uh, it's got my own tick in a little bit so I do wonder how well this is going to be supported um, because I would imagine the game would also have to support this in some way, but still, it's really interesting. Now, obviously, as we've said many times, just because there's a pattern existing doesn't mean we're actually going to see this manifest itself in the actual console, but um, I'm definitely intrigued. But to finish up today's video, we're going to finish up with some comments from Phil Spencer regarding the Xbox Scarlet. So nothing mind-blowing or world-ending here, I'm afraid. Just some hints as to what the name of the console is actually going to be for you to get chewing over. I'd love to hear your thoughts and suggestions for this in the comments below. So basically, Phil Spencer was speaking with Stevivore at X019, and he basically said that the name of the console is going to be all about its capabilities, which is pretty much what they've done with the last two Xbox consoles. He said, quote, Our naming convention has been around what we think capabilities are. Xbox 360 was about the entertainment experience around the box, and the box being in the centre of that entertainment experience. 
Xbox One, if you remember our branding early on, was always on input, all in one. Those names were really built around the purpose of the box. I don't feel like I need to follow in their footsteps because they're kind of self-contained. So, again, no real hints as to what they're going to be calling it, but definitely enough to get your mind sort of whirling. Again, hit me up with your, with your thoughts in the comments. I want to see who's going to be closest, to be honest, when it's announced most likely at E3 next year. Come back to this video and uh, see who was the closest out of all of you. I have no idea, um, unfortunately. No clue. But do remember that we are hearing rumours regarding Project Lockhart, Lockhart and Project Anaconda existing as well. So, two skews. Don't forget that as well. I think that's definitely going to come into the naming convention of whatever these consoles end up being. But, of course, that's all pure speculation. Nothing more to say on that front, unfortunately. Wish I had some mind-bending news about this price or release date or something, but I can only give what the great news fairy in the sky decides to give us for today. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, the support is highly appreciated, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.